I'd like to start by asking you about the benefits of net zero and particularly so why did um, Anglian Water set a net zero goal? What are the benefits and why is that goal important to you? Well, it's important to us because um, I suppose we're in the front line of uh, the impact of a changing climate. We're, we're in one of the driest parts of the country in Anglian Waters region. We're also at significant risk of flood um, and we're trying to serve an increasing population just in the next five years alone. I think the population of the area we serve goes up by about six percent and those pressures combined with the fact that we're also one of the most energy intensive industries meant that it really wasn't an option for us to ignore ignore this and it wasn't really an option not to take a leadership position on it as well and uh, as a company we've got a purpose a very clear purpose which is to uh, ensure and bring environmental and social prosperity to the region we serve through our commitment to love every drop and you can see as a result of that we really did have to be in the vanguard of setting uh, a really ambitious net zero target so it, it, in the process of being in that vanguard and, and you've got that target what um what are some of the actions that you're taking, the positive actions you're taking to make that, that goal a reality? Well, this is something we've been doing for, for many years. Um, and in the last five years alone, we've saved something like 400,000 tonnes of carbon. And we've made a commitment along with other companies in the water industry uh, to achieving net zero by 2030. Um, and it's demonstrated to us not only the importance of having our own plan to get to 2030, but also the opportunities that come from working with others and you know the, the much higher level of innovation you get when you, you when you genuinely collaborate on what ultimately is is a common a common challenge so uh, we've adopted adopted that as a sector um, it's something we're all working on but then each company has its own uh, route map to net zero by 2030 um, and in ours, we're really focusing on a sort of three level hierarchy. You know, how, how can we ultimately reduce the emissions as the very first thing we can do? And um, how can we decarbonize um, the supply of power? Um, and there's lots of opportunities there as well for uh, renewables. And then ultimately, you know, if we do have to offset residual emissions, how do we do that in a way that delivers maximum local benefit as opposed to and, and something we can have real, real confidence in? Excellent. Then, but then if we take it from the other side, if we think about sort of some of the challenges you've encountered in that, that, that impressive pathway of action, what have been some of the most significant hurdles you've encountered? Well, one of the very uh, big challenges for us is on uh, regarding process emissions, and this is particularly process emissions from our water recycling operations. Uh, and this is because I think the, the science around process emissions probably wasn't as well understood. The baselines weren't as clear. Um, and so we're having to do a lot of work as a company and in fact across the whole sector on understanding how to really um, track what the current level of process emissions are in order to you know, then look at what changes we need to make in order to reduce process emissions on that journey to net zero. So that's a particular, a particular challenge. Um, but there are other you know, challenges, you know, particularly I think about renewables. Um, Lots of issues associated with planning, uh, planning permissions, particularly for onshore wind, which was in the very early days some, something we saw a lot of opportunity for. Um, and you know, really, these are things that we've really got to unlock to get the pace um, necessary to hit net zero by by 2030. So if you were to kind of cast your mind back to sort of kicking off on this journey, what do you know now that you wish you'd known then? Uh, hmm, that's a great question. I, I think it would have been much better for us to have had a, a, a more insight into how other sectors and other parts of the supply chain are actually decarbonising and some of their some of the strategies that they've been employing. I, I think that would have helped us. 
um, because in some places we kind of feel we started this, you know, from a from our own perspective. But I think there was there was probably more going on than we realised. So I think that would have been helpful. I think perhaps a better understanding of the uh, trajectory around grid decarbonisation would also have been helpful. Um, that's been a changing situation, but a, probably a fuller picture of that at the outset would have helped. Um, and also um, improved understanding of that sort of tipping point between you know, where, where carbon saves you money and where it actually starts to cost you more. That probably would have been, probably would have been helpful as well. If you were at an event, at a discussion with a spoke to a CEO of a business who was just, they just set their net zero target, or they're just about to, and they're just like, we really want to go for this, but it, it, there's so much. Where do we start? What what do we do first? Um, what 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 learning point, what insight would you want to set, share with the company, sort of at the beginning of the journey in that way? Well, well, I think there's something there's something um, very helpful about being in a group of organisations traveling on, on the path together. Um, I mean, if I think about some of the early, early work that we were doing in CLG, it was always very helpful to be talking to other organizations who kind of got the importance of this, but also were open to sharing ideas um, because, you know, we don't sit here as a company with a font of all knowledge in this area. And uh, sometimes other organizations in different sectors give insight, which makes you think very differently. So that that is always helpful. So communities of interest um, on the journey. What's been the secret for Anglian Water as to, to, you know, unlocking that success in terms of being able to tap into the the inventive energy in your supply chain? Well, I think it starts with having a, a deeper relationship with, you know, your, your partners, really. I, I mean, I, I think if it's a purely a transactional thing and you see them once in a blue moon, it's quite difficult to get any, any sort of change going on in your supply chain. So I think you have to think about a longer term, deeper relationship. I think once you've got that, then you need to think about it from the perspective of what makes the partners in the, you, know, you and the supplier successful. And, you know, where we've got examples where we've been out, you know, our supply chain have then been able to go out and sell products and services to other organisations off the back of their own carbon credentials, which have been on that journey to help us. So, um it's it's about thinking about it as opportunity as opposed to a burden as well. Um, just to kind of the last few few questions and very much thinking about the current moment that we're in. Um, so we're coming up to COP26. I mentioned it earlier, big event in Glasgow uh, this November. What, are, what outcomes or what signals are you hoping that might uh, materialise from that event? Well, I, I suppose at the first level, I mean, is making sure everybody's signed up to a budget in the same way this country has. You know, that that's I mean, it's blindingly obvious again, but it's, that's important. Um, so we need to we need to make sure and use that um, event to continue that and continue pushing that and driving that momentum. Um, I think the other thing is that I, I've always thought that it's really important that we don't just have conversations in silos. So I would like to think that particularly adaptation and, and the need to build resilience is also being talked about. Um, and certainly that uh, at um, COP26, that's one of the things that we're going to be contributing is quite a lot of the experience around how do you build resilience? How do you think about what's already entrained and what's already going to be happening? Because that that's it. That's really important. So we mustn't think about these things in just silos, which, you know, the nature of these things, sometimes that's that's what's, what can uh, what can happen. Um, I think the other one for me would be thinking about the financing of it. And how, how do we how do we continue to think about the frameworks which might help to unlock investment in projects that deliver towards net zero? And we, we've certainly seen as a company huge opportunities coming out of our drive to, uh, to reduce capital carbon, for example. I think we've got to about a, a billion pounds worth of bonds that we've issued, green bonds, 
all linked into essentially our credentials of delivering low carbon uh, infrastructure, which has opened up you know, better value finance, basically. So there is certainly, I mean, people talk about this wall of green finance, it absolutely is, and it's growing, and it's global, and um, countries and organizations that see it will, will be the, you know, and can, can lean into that, will be the first that get opportunities from it.